but we don't buy it. GM denies it, but we don't buy it. We're here today because Colombian General Motors workers are starting their third week of hunger strike outside the United States Embassy in Bogota. These workers were disabled on the job. They were dismissed by General Motors without workers' compensation, without retraining, without disability payments. They've been occupying the curb outside the U.S. Embassy for over a year now, continuously and peacefully. All they're asking for is justice. They know the United States still owns one-third of General Motors. They know the labor action plan agreed to by the U U.S. and Colombian governments is supposed to guarantee that labor abuses of this sort will stop. Today, people across the U.S. are taking it to General Motors directly. In Detroit, there'll be a rally outside GM headquarters. In McLean, Virginia, there'll be a rally outside the residence of GM's CEO. We're here today in Portland because four of us here have met these workers personally. We've seen the scars on their bodies. We've met their families. We know how serious this is. And we're asking everyone to join us in appealing directly to General Motors and to our government to act now for basic justice for disabled workers in Colombia victimized by General Motors and on hunger strike. For a year, there was no uh, support from the United States and, and nothing from GM to try to fix this problem. So starting on August 1st of this year, uh, they began a hunger strike. Uh, and so it's two weeks into the hu hunger strike, or almost three weeks into the hunger strike, and uh, several days ago, a number of the workers actually sewed their lips shut uh, to show their seriousness about maintaining this hunger strike uh, for as long as it took for them to get justice for these uh, work-related injuries that they didn't get any workers' compensation for and that they got thrown to their street, they can't feed their families, they're surviving off the uh, love and, and solidarity of their local communities. Uh, and in the meantime, they're taking this drastic measure of a hunger strike uh, to show the world that this injustice needs to be corrected. So I guess we're calling on everyone to make this issue viral in their communities and throughout the country and throughout the world so that that pressure causes the United States and General Motors to do the right thing and to correct this problem for the workers. We're here to tell GM, General Motors, do the right thing, sit down and negotiate with your workers, take care of them and their needs. These workers have given you their hours, their time, their salary. They have given you their family time, their children time, their children play time, so they can build the best uh, of the cars and you in exchange have fired them because they got injured at your workplace and you are denying what happened in your workplace that's a shame on you you know how workers um, accidents happens that's part of the job so you just gotta take care of it and pay for their medical bills and make them whole as much as you can and their families firing them is not gonna get you anywhere that's not an american thing americans we take care of our problems and responsibilities we face them so we're asking you we citizens here in Portland, Oregon, to take care of the workers, shame of you. We will continue fighting you, protesting you, and broadcasting everywhere in the United States what you're doing. This is not okay to mistreat workers in Colombia. What we want is you to represent Americans with pride overseas in Colombia and everywhere. So we're not going to let you uh, you know, create bad publicity for Americans here in the United States. GM, shame on you. This situation is one example of globalization. This is what happens in a globalized economy where multinational corporations can exploit the situation that's the weakest in terms of labor rights and victimize workers without consequences. In this particular case, there's a recently implemented free trade agreement between the United States and Colombia. We were promised, the people of both countries were promised by our presidents that a labor action plan would precede the implementation of that trade agreement and it would improve the climate for labor rights. All this happened really has been on paper so far. In the workplace, very little has changed. Union leaders are still killed. People are still fired as these workers were unjust. People still cannot organize unions. People still lack direct employment. In Colombia, there's a widespread situation of injustice in the workplace. 
This is one of the worst examples of that. And what's more, in a globalized economy, this is our future. If we don't act now to put a stop to this sort of abuse, down the road, we'll experience it right here at home. We're not going to tolerate to America to squeeze this scumbag company to destroy families in Colombia and anywhere in the world. give us a little uh, uh, synopsis of what this issue is going to be all about and hopefully folks were lucky enough to tune into that. We have the one, the one of the speakers on the show that was on the video, uh, John Walsh, with Witness, Witness for Peace. It's Witness, not Witnesses, right? Witness, yeah. one Witness, of them. Witness for Peace. And uh, we're going to go a little bit more into depth. We're going to play some videos from their website, which was uh, ASO Tracol, A S. -T O-T-R-E-C-O-L dot com. We're going to have graphics for that. Last week we had problems with the graphics machine. We think that we have them nailed down. We're going to bring some graphics up as we go and give you places to go on that website, astrical dot com. There is numerous videos that are being shot down there in Columbia where this is going on. We're going to run a few tonight, we hope, uh, straight off of YouTube and get folks an idea of what's going on down there. Then you can follow up, go to their website, go to their page, Facebook page, and, uh, and, uh, and fill in some of the details if, if we don't happen to uh, touch all the bases. And uh, we'll get some phones going on, old quarter tail or so, and maybe we can get some uh, dialogue going with people here in Portland. And uh, we'd like to touch bases and let folks know, hmm, why is this important to people in Portland, what's going on in Columbia? Uh, whether it's General Motors, and in the past it's been Coca-Cola, Half of the uh, la half the people killed over labor issues in the world, I believe, are are are, are it's, it's happening in Colombia. So uh, that's one reason it's affecting you is is the murder of, of fellow human beings. But we'll uh, we'll we'll get into more of that as we go along. So uh, John, welcome to the program. Thank you. How long have you been with Witness for Peace? I've been active with Witness for Peace since so oh, 2009. The first time I went to Colombia with Witness for Peace. So that was just recently? Well, 2009 was the first trip, went back in 2011 last year. Mm -hmm. So two trips that I've made myself. I'm also, full disclosure, on the National Board of Witness for Peace. Mm -hmm. So I'm involved pretty much continuously one way or another. So there's a local chapter, but you don't have necessarily a website or anything locally then? There's a national website, which is witnessforpeace.org, and that has pretty much all the information, mm -hmm. including what's going on regionally in every part of the country, of mm -hmm. the U.S., and also by country uh, where their programs operated by Witness for Peace. Colombia, Cuba is a very interesting one for many people. Mexico, Nicaragua, Honduras most recently. So people can find detailed information about specific countries of interest for them. Mm -hmm. I know we were talking a little while ago before the, uh, we went to the studio here and I was surprised. I thought all this happened in August when they went on their hunger strike. But obviously they went on their hunger, you're thinking about it, they went on their hunger strike because of an ongoing issue. And you say this went back to November of the year of uh, 2011? They've actually been occupying the curb. These guys, they got kicked to the curb by the company. They said, okay, you kicked us to the curb, we're going to occupy the curb. And the curb they picked is the one across the street from the U.S. Embassy. They've been there since August of last year. So the day they started their hunger strike was the 365th day oh, I see. that they'd okay. been there. Mm -hmm. right? And we first met them, I personally and other people from Portland, two other people from Portland first met them in November of this past year. Not just the workers, but their families as well. So mm -hmm. we met them at their occupation site right across from the embassy back then. And we've stayed in touch ever since. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned, you went down there and they came up here. And uh, obviously, when you went down there, you were you were working with the people. And what did they do when they came up here? Were you traveling around the different cities explaining the situation? What happened is that people from that delegation uh, were very touched by this struggle and wanted to help these guys win. So uh, one of our, our delegation members was from Detroit, had some connections with Labor Notes, which some people may know if you follow labor stuff at all, publication based in Detroit, mm -hmm. and also with the UAW, the Auto Workers Union. So we were able, with the help of those connections and doing some fundraising amongst ourselves, to get invitations for the president of this group, Jorge Parra is the man's name, to come to the United States for the Labor Notes Conference in Chicago in May and to visit the UAW in Michigan right after that. Mm -hmm. So we brought him up here. 
Uh, he'd never been out of Columbia before in his life. It was quite an experience for him. I'll bet. <laughs> Brought him to the conference. Uh, Paige, Shell Sperling, and myself from Portland accompanied him at the conference. So we translated for him with people who don't speak Spanish. He does not speak English. Uh, he met many people there. He was part of a panel discussion. And then we drove him, I drove him across to Michigan to meet with United Auto Workers. So he met in person with the president of the UAW, Bob King, restaurant in Ann Arbor. He also made a presentation at Solidarity House, which is the headquarters of the United Auto Workers. And for him, I mean, he said if in Columbia all the union people were brought together in one room like they are at Labor Notes, someone would blow the place up. He said there's no way they could do that. He was wide-eyed and amazed at what he perceived as the strength of our labor movement, which we ourselves perceive as being pretty weak. So it was sort of an eye-opener for both interesting, sides. Interesting, interesting, yeah, because, you know, like, I forget what it was, how many people were in labor movements in their 70s, and by and, and now it's like, what, a third of what it was back then. I don't remember the exact figures, but it, it's, it's you know, starting with Reagan, it's really gone downhill. Right, but he's, and I'm a union member also, I should add, I'm a Teamster member. He sees the glass is half full, we see it half empty. Half empty it's course. kind of a wake-up call for us that if these guys can conduct the sort of fight they're fighting under those circumstances, what's wrong with us? What's up here? How come we can't do better? That's kind of one of the reasons I want to bring this on is, uh, you know, the, these folks down there and, 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 and in other parts of the world too. I mean, you know, I was just reading about in the 60s where the the, the French students, I think, took to the streets and just about toppled the government. That kind of stuff doesn't happen around here. People don't uh, line up and sew their lips together. I mean, you know, it, 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 uh, I'm not necessarily saying that to chastise us here in this country. It's just the dynamics are so different. Well, in fact, while we were in Columbia in November, the students, speaking of that, had a nationwide mobilization against a law, proposed law, that would have privatized much of higher education. And they succeeded. The students occupied spaces. We were at the primary port city on the west coast of Columbia, Pacific coast of Columbia. The students occupied the one bridge, it's an island, the port, all day long and basically shut it down as part of their protest. And the students won. The students succeeded in rolling back this proposal. Mm -hmm. So again, if they can do that there with the type of threat, real physical threat they face, what's up with us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot is just is, uh, is the, uh, st the strategy and, and being able to stick with it. Uh, it here, people, uh, they go to a rally and then they go home and, and you know, they, they forget about it. They think they've done enough. And uh, it, it, uh, it has to be intense. Of course, the situation there is a lot worse than the situation here because of what you're talking about. They'd blow the room up. We don't have to deal with that. They don't have to be so violent over here with, with labor because they've got the media on their side. Well, the commitment there is incredible. I mean, just today, we heard today that the electricity to the occupation site had been cut off. They've had electricity wired into their, their tent across from the embassy. Across from the embassy, yeah. Right, and that's necessary for communication, for one thing, because we communicate by internet with them, so they have to have power for the, the computers, for their, their gear to do that. But there are also two of these workers who are diabetic, and they need their medication refrigerated. Exactly. Today, the electricity was cut off. We were told, I can't verify it obviously from here, but we were told the U.S. Embassy was the responsible party for the shutoff of their electricity. So here we have workers whose rights have been violated, who are appealing to our government for support in securing their rights. And not only is it not you know, happening in that support, but our embassy is getting the power shut off to them to make their situation even worse as they're on hunger strike now in the third week. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a, a someone in the control room a little while ago, and uh, you know, Obama touting his his bailout of General Motors is such a great success, and you know, and, as, and it's and it's we're looking at it within a box, I guess that it is. But come to find out that uh, a lot of General Motors is now in China. And General a lot Motors, of General Motors is in Colombia. So yeah. really, how much is that really helping the American people? I don't know. Do you, do you have any, any feedback on that? Well, I'd at least like it not to harm other people. Yeah, so if, right if my and your tax dollars mm -hmm. are keeping General Motors going, which I'm, I'm happy to see that happen. I think it's a good thing to maintain jobs producing stuff here in the U.S. Sure. I, I think we need too. that, yes. Mm -hmm. But I don't want our money paying for abusing somebody someplace else. Mm -hmm. So if a worker gets hurt on the job, whether it's here, whether it's there, whether it's some other country, that worker should be taken care of properly, mm -hmm. shouldn't be kicked to the curb, shouldn't be denied medical treatment, disability or pension or retraining for another job. And that's what's happened to these guys. They've been denied the basic essential justice that is due anyone who gets hurt on their job. I don't know what the situation down there. Is it like here, there's an unemployment uh, employment office that they go through and they get denied the claim or is it just, it just what happens? Just, that's yeah. it. In some cases, there were several different methods used, but in some cases there was falsified paperwork. 
that claimed that the worker had signed something voluntarily quitting the job. The worker had never, never seen that paperwork, but a labor inspector who was in cahoots with an attorney who worked with GM authorized that paperwork as being legitimate. Mm -hmm. And the worker on paper officially left work voluntarily, but in reality got fired, didn't even know it in those cases. Now that, it's funny you mentioned that, because I was going to bring that up, you know, the word fascism, the, the, uh, the, the marriage between corporation and state. And, uh, you know, we, that word's thrown around really handily in this country. And, and, and there is, obviously, with, with the, uh, the recent uh, decisions by the Supreme Court has made that connection much stronger. But apparently that's going on down there as well, and probably even more so. Well, it turned out the same attorney and lawyer had pulled the same stunt some years back with a different corporation. So, I mean, who knows what the role of GM is in this, whether someone's just looking the other way or more actively involved. I can't assess that from the outside. Mm -hmm. But the consequences are so obvious. I mean, we, as the video said, we've seen these workers. We've met them personally. I've seen the scars on their bodies. I've seen them walk with canes. Uh, it's obvious they're injured, and it's obvious that's not something that happened to you sweeping the floor at home. So mm -hmm. the fact that their injuries are not treated appropriately, it's just a, a screaming injustice. It, it's a basic affront to any sense of decency in the workplace. Well, that's what very well put. And so they're all working on the assembly line. If anybody, any viewers out there have been on an assembly line, they know that uh, uh, it's dangerous work and you have to work fast. And, uh, and, and, the, and the, uh, if you're injured, you know, you're pulled off and someone takes your place and, and they know, typically here you workman's compensation takes care of all that. But uh, they, they weren't even given the, the, uh, the uh, workman's compensation, went to doctors and all that. They were just booted out, out the door right away. It was a longstanding pattern. When these guys stood up and made a fight out of it, the company has since started to change their practice inside the plant. So the workers there now are rotated between different types of work, or at least different stations doing that type of work. Uh, robots have been installed, a couple for the first time. But that doesn't help the guys already hurt. They're still outside on the street with nothing. So their struggle has succeeded in helping other workers, which is a good thing, and it's positive the company has taken some steps internally. But these guys and their families are still out in the cold. Right, and the steps are taken is, is in such a way that uh, just like in the forest, uh, it's all mechanized now. So there's, they, they're standing up for that, and uh, there may be safer conditions, but at the same time, there's less workers that are needed. Well, actually what's happened, Columbia's gotten the hand-me-down equipment so something that used to be in the U.S. may have been moved to Mexico. It then may have gone from Mexico to Colombia. So there are several generations behind in terms of production technology. Mm -hmm. And what that's meant, when they switched from producing one model of vehicle to another, instead of redesigning the production line the way it would happen here, they've done a lot of that just sort of on the fly and manually. So it's more strenuous work. It's less ergonomic work. And that results in increased injuries. Mm -hmm. They had video. They filmed video inside the plant they showed us. One guy had to pick up the entire car by the door to adjust the fit of the door. So you see him lifting the whole vehicle off the ground by the door 142 times in a shift. I was just going to say, yeah, you could do that once. You could do that 10 times. But, you know, ergonomically, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, the, the, the spine and all, you know, many different parts of the body, that's going to affect in the long run. Right. And they have large welding rigs. They're suspended from the ceiling, but they have to wrestle them into position to make the welds. So you're trying to, to pull all this weight into the right place and hold it to make your welds. Things like that just break down these guys' bodies. Mm -hmm. Did the, uh, Was that a particular uh, factory or whatever moved down there from the United States, or was that they just went down there and opened one up, you know? I think it's been there since 1956, the operation. If that, that's not the exact year, it's certainly been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it's about as old as I am, roughly, okay? Um, the equipment, in many cases, as we understand it, was hand-me-down equipment. So as far as what they actually have by way of production technology, they view themselves as being 30, 40 years behind the times. Mm -hmm. I'm not an engineer. I can't tell you exactly. Right. But the basic point is they're not using state-of-the-art methods. Right. And, and uh, apparently the, uh, the workers suffer for that. Uh, how many workers are we talking about that, are, that had been injured? Obviously, they're probably not all at, at this uh, vigil or whatever. Right. They figured that at least a couple hundred they knew about had been injured. The association itself, when we went in November, had 68 active members guys who'd lost their jobs and were, were part of this protest in front of the embassy. Now, over time, they've lost their homes to foreclosure. Uh, they haven't been able to feed their families. So they've been worn down, and attrition has reduced the ranks to the 13 guys who are holding out now, the 13 on hunger strike in front of the embassy. Mm -hmm. But obviously, if they win, that's a positive thing for the rest of the group, too. 
So these 13 are fighting for themselves, yes, but also for other people. Mm -hmm. That uh, that's you mentioned you know, the, the wife and kids, and I was gonna that was gonna be my next point. You see, we seem to be on the same beam here. This isn't just 13 people that are standing up for for workers. These are families involved, and as you say, they've left. Just like here, they've lost their homes. Basically, you know, uh, with, with the main reason that people lose their their homes and file bankruptcy in this country is because of uh, medical bills. The same situation is going on down there. Right, they're not getting medical care. That's a very good thing to bring up because in their situation, I mean, I might get by without medical care being basically healthy. Hopefully it stays that way. These guys obviously need medical care all the time and they don't get it because their injuries were not classified as being occupational. As far as the families, in November when we met with them, typically a witness or peace delegation meets with various groups and a workers group, usually it's the workers. In this case, besides the workers, it was the workers' spouses, the workers' kids, uh, there was this whole, probably, you know, twice as many people who are family as there were workers themselves. So we're sitting there having the meeting, and next to me was somebody's daughter asking questions about life in the United States whenever there was a gap in the conversation. Uh -huh, right. And two places over there, somebody nursing a baby. And, I mean, the whole family was there. It was obvious the commitment, and it was obvious who gets affected by this. It's not just the worker. It's also their entire family. Yeah, and this is what democracy looks like. And, yes, and <laughs> what family, what true family values mm -hmm, look like, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, that brings up the point that I understand that at one point the the delegation, whatever it's called, from the, uh, from the General Motors walked out of the talks. What happened on Monday, August 6th, the Colombian Ministry of Labor convened a mediation session. And the body the, that was supposed the to Columbia mediate... Columbia what did? Ministry of Labor. It's oh, like okay. our Department of Labor, oh, so okay. it's part of the federal government in Colombia. Right. So basically the highest body that could said, come on, come to the table, let's talk this out. Uh, the arbitrators or mediators actually were Colombian jurists and a man from Argentina who's with the International Labor Organization. So you had respectable, reputable uh, people to try and mediate. The workers went in first. Each side presents their case. They presented their case for about an hour. They left the room. The four representatives of GM Colombia entered the room. Also present, I should add, was the Inspector General Office of Colombia. These are people who investigate allegations of fraud, abuse, and so on. Mm -hmm. So they have facts. They've been paying attention to this for a long time. They could refute allegations by the company that everything was on the up and up and these guys had been treated properly. That apparently angered the company because they walked out of the negotiation and the mediation after about two hours and just never came back. So there was a process underway to try and resolve this uh, with a, a neutral party trying to bring the two groups together and the company just walked away from that. Well, did they just question the neutrality of the, of the, of the of the inspector general and those, or they just didn't give any reason? They I don't know exactly what they said. I don't know if they gave any reason at all, but we do feel that the fact that the inspector general was there to be able to refute allegations that were not factual made uh, a difference for the company. Man, they weren't ready for that. They, they couldn't blow smoke. They had to face facts, and that apparently was not a comfortable situation for them. Mm -hmm. Before we get into the first video, uh, the, the, the video that opened the program was at the uh, Pioneer Square, obviously, you probably could tell that, uh, earlier in the week, and it was, uh, it was just a small group of people, but they were trying to, to do a little bit of a, a awareness of what's going on, but that was just in Portland. I understand that there was larger events going on in other parts of the country. That same day in Detroit, there was a rally outside GM's worldwide headquarters, the Renaissance Center in downtown Detroit. Uh, there was also a visit paid by a small group to the uh, large home of the CEO of GM, which is in McLean, Virginia. There were also actions. Seattle had an online action, basically. There was a fast and vigil a couple days prior to that in Texas, Arlington, Texas, outside a GM assembly plant. There were people, over 200 people nationwide, personally committed to fast for a day or several in solidarity with the people in Columbia and posted pictures of themselves online saying, I'm fasting in solidarity. Mm -hmm. So they posted those to GM's website or also to some other websites on Facebook for Asa I, I think that there was one other channel, eight possibly, that uh, briefly covered what was going on here. Are we getting any, any corporate media coverage at, at these enough, rallies and whatever you were talking about? Yeah, before? oddly enough, in Latin America, Fox has covered it to some oh, extent. Really? In Latin America mm -hmm. and the Wall Street Journal Latin America. Up north... Uh, a Toronto paper picked it up, and then a, I think the New York Daily News picked up the Toronto story. So it's beginning to emerge into mainstream media. Obviously not enough, and people aren't aware because this is clearly a very urgent situation. But it is beginning to cross over from the independent sources to the mainstream sources. Mm -hmm. 
need to get someone like uh, Rachel Maddow or somebody to talk about That would about be great, this, sure. You know? yeah. Has there been any any motions made in that direction by Witness? Because Witness for Peace is a fairly high-powered national or international organization. Well, a bunch of other groups are involved in this, too, I should make clear. The Latin oh, American good. Working Group, the Washington Office on Latin America, uh, United Steelworkers have played a big part trying to help Minnesota yeah, FL CIO. Those are powerful so, groups. Yeah, so there, there's a wide range of groups. It's not just one organization that's, that's out there working on this. And many of them have tried to use their contacts both with politicians, with Congress, with the administration, executive branch, mm -hmm. uh, with the media, and every place they can think of, basically, to try and, and get mm -hmm. a solution now. Just to shine the light on is what we need. Right. You know, once the light is shined on it and people know about it, which is, you know, why I want to do this program is to, is to let folks know, go to the website, see what's going on. And, uh, you know, if, if enough people voice their concern about this, the, the corporate media will cover it. Yes. You know, as much as they don't want to, you know, like, you know, the best example of that is the Occupy movement. Uh, they, they ignored that for, what, a couple of weeks. And once, uh, I forget who it was, I think it was Lawrence O'Donnell first started talking about it when that one cop did some real damage to somebody. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he started talking about it. And once once that ball starts rolling, then they all have to jump on board. And, and something like this, and it isn't just what's happening down there. there there's situations like this going on worldwide. And this this is just one one uh, light shining on a problem that is, is going on outside the scope of that spotlight as well. We want this to reach the mainstream media and popular opinion before someone loses their life because we know these guys personally. It matters to us personally. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, you worked with the crew in there and you got uh, three windows open with different videos and hopefully we'll get these in the proper sequence here. Your first video was going to be the actual announcement of the of the of the uh, hunger strike. You might go into that a little bit then we'll play it. Right. This is the announcement they made the day they had their four of them had their lips sewn shut. Many of them uh, began the hunger strike at the same time but four actually had their lips sewn shut and they explained their reasons first before that happened then they had the lips sewn shut and showed what that looked like after the fact. All right, so this is a little two-minute clip. Hopefully we'll get the right one. I don't know. Is there any audio going on? Con los labios oh, good, there he is. Nosotros somos la Asociación de Trabajadores y Trabajadores Enfermos de General Motors. Por todo lo que oh, hemos venido know. denunciando contra General Motors, por Looks los awful. atropellos que existen hacia sus trabajadores en Colombia. Vamos más de un año muriéndonos lentamente cada día frente a la embajada de los Estados Unidos. Prácticamente nos da lo mismo morirnos de hambre o morirnos esperando a que ellos eh, nos solucionen esta problemática. Eh, estamos decididos llegar a llegar hasta las últimas consecuencias y bueno que Dios nos acompañe y nos ayude. Amén. Bien, esperamos contar con su ayuda y con su apoyo llamando al señor embajador en Colombia Peter McKinley y también a Dan Arkerson, presidente de General Motors. I think they need to leave them phone numbers up there a little longer. Uh, but uh, You can find the phone number if you didn't get it and you want it. You can go to the State Department website and there's a, a tab you can click on that shows you the embassy. It has the phone number there. Right, yeah, if, if folks want to find that out. Well, you know, obviously I think to anybody that, that watched that, uh, once they get past that, that uh, you know, look like a voodoo doll almost there, uh, the dedication to these folks is phenomenal. And, you know, those folks that were sitting there were Colombian, but, you know, I could easily picture... 
any number of union members that I've seen downtown uh, for free trade or all the different, many of the different uh, jobs with justice rallies and things. I mean, that could be, it could be any one of them folks, except that in, 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 in this country, I, w I can't say they're not as dedicated, but the, the, they're not needing to be as drastic yet. Necessity and, is very powerful motivation, and these guys are mm -hmm. facing necessity. So mm -hmm. as I think Jorge said here, I mean, they felt they were gonna basically face this fate anyway. They were essentially facing starvation for lack of income. So rather than simply die of neglect and accept mm -hmm. it that way, uh, they figured they might as well make a fight of it and go down fighting. Mm -hmm. You know, I probably should know this, you probably covered it, but are they part of a union down there? What happened in this plant, there was a strong union and through a combination of two things, one was a strike in 1997 that the company broke. There was a combined strike and lockout. That's the, that's the dangers of a strike. Well, but <laughs> no. the other thing was change in labor law. So it was about 2003, 2004, something called a collective pact was allowed in Columbia. A collective pact is sort of a sham contract. The people who represent the workers are chosen by management, not by the workers. Uh -huh. And right now, workers are required, if they want employment, to sign the collective pact, which includes promising not to belong to a union. It only lasts for two years. So if you don't have more than two years job security, you're not likely to put up a big fuss fighting for your rights. Plus, you already said you won't join the union. So the collective pact is the dominant mode inside the plant. There are a few guys left from the old union, but they're such a small group, they don't have power, don't have leverage. Mm -hmm. And the company doesn't bother messing with them because they're getting close to retirement. It's not worth fighting. And that group's too small to put up a fight themselves. So there is actually a union in the plant, but not one that's capable of doing much. And one of the demands these guys put forward was to be able to form a union. Of course, to do that, they have to get back in the plant and get to work, and that's another big hurdle. That's another, yeah. Yeah, it sounds to me like that, that that union has been tamped down quite a bit, just like they have been in this country. And that's a favorite tactic, you know, that the, 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 the government or the, or the, uh, or the whoever, the authorities of the, of the company uh, set themselves up to, to make the decision on, on uh, what is being done. I mean, that, that's pretty much the end of it, the end of democracy anyway. Another aspect of that, though, is we have something called the Labor Action Plan for Colombia which President Obama and President Santos agreed to before the free trade agreement entered into effect, supposed to improve labor rights. One of its specific points was to stop the use of collective PACs to prevent unions. Here we have GM, prominent corporation headquartered in the U.S. Everybody knows about them. It's not some small mom and pop yeah, operation, biggest right? Biggest corporation in the world. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're using the collective pact to prevent union formation in the plant. So if this plan, labor action plan meant something, this situation should not continue to exist. Maybe it would have before, but after this plan came about, it should have changed. Mm -hmm. So the workers on their encampment have a sign that says the labor action plan is a failure right under the nose of the U.S. Embassy, which it is. Mm -hmm. It's not something, I mean, the Embassy sees this every day. It's right in their face. So they can't say they're uninformed, unaware. What are they going to do about it? Right. Um, wanting to wait a little bit later to talk a little bit about free trade and maybe we'll get into it a little bit later but this is a perfect segue we just signed a free trade agreement with Colombia does it have anything to do with the ability to tamp down these labor unions and, and what you were just saying well we're supposed to be doing what you were just saying was being done and and it's, it's not happening is that partly because of free trade agreements certainly certainly I mean free trade agreements increase the power of corporations to control economies at both ends of the deal whether it's the U.S. economy or the Colombian economy. And there were specific commitments made to try and mitigate some of those abuses, the collective pact being one being example one of, of them, that. Yeah. Also contingent employment, which is prevalent in Colombia where people don't have any job security, was another point. And these guys have two-year contracts. They don't have any job security, even though they're highly skilled and do work, they're not you know, readily able to, to adapt to some other situation. Uh, another point was to prevent the violence or reduce the violence against union leaders. Well, union leaders have been killed since this plan went into force. So on paper, I mean, the, the plan itself conceptually is a good idea. No question about that. It'd be a step forward. Not enough, but at least it goes in the right direction. The problem is what's actually happened has been on paper and not in the workplace. So it's one thing if somebody says that, you know, you're going to get equipment that makes you safe on the job, whatever that might be, whether it's, you know, protective goggles or earplugs or what have you. And on paper, there's a plan to do that, and someone can show you a document. Well, the way this plan has been implemented, that would be considered compliance, even though you yourself don't actually have the goggles or the earplugs. <laughs> right. So what good does it do? Mm -hmm. You know, so this plan is, it's words so far. They're good words as far as they go, but it hasn't changed the life of the worker. 
Right. By plan, you're not talking about the free trade agreement in general. You're talking about these specific the slave reaction collected. plan, yeah. which, which actually was kept out of the free trade agreement. So it's not enforceable other than trying to hold politicians accountable for keeping their promises. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the free trade agreement uh, is viewed. I, mean, I was surprised myself the first time going to Columbia at how universal the opposition to it was in the people we spoke with who were not executives and were not all well, some were politicians, actually. But, you know, I had the view that we were against it, knowing we would lose jobs. We would have a, a damaged economy, many of us because of it. Uh, but the Colombians felt even worse about it. They felt it's going to cause people to be displaced from their homes because mm -hmm. corporations covet natural resources that are beneath where indigenous communities live or Afro-Colombian communities live, that people who want to clear land for port mm -hmm. expansion, which comes with the free trade agreement, would displace ghetto residents, slum residents, violently. And none of those people have any political clout or, or whatever. No, they don't. They don't. And they, they're disadvantaged historically. They also often don't have legal title because they've held land collectively. Mm. So they don't have the same process to defend their rights as people might if they were in a more middle class setting, which also happens in Colombia, but they don't have the same chance of defending themselves uh, that someone, other people might in mm -hmm. a modern, quote unquote, legalistic framework. No, no, that makes sense. Well, I think maybe it's time we listen to some of the families. Yes, that's a good idea. So that's what the second clip is about. It's the second one shows the family, the specific family of one of these workers and lets the family members, the wife and daughter, talk about the situation. All right, hopefully we'll get that right one up. The crew's doing a great job tonight. Perfect. Realmente la situación después de que nos despidieron que me despidieron a mí la empresa ha sido muy dura para mi familia y para mí. Nos han cortado el agua, el gas. ¿Cuál? Pues nos han cortado la luz. Que la niña menor de nosotros se quemó la mano con una vela. Con una vela. Se quemó con una vela porque ya llevamos seis meses sin luz. Y ella es una hermana que it's really well readable and that's some white behind it. Estamos curando solo con con remedios caseros. Por falta de la EPS eh, no hemos podido ir al médico. Se veía rojo, rojo, rojo. Ahorita ya tengo costa. Tengo un hijo recién nacido, no tengo pañales. Eh, mi señora tuvo un embarazo después de que yo salí de la empresa. Tuvo un embarazo duro porque casi lo pierdo, fue un embarazo de alto riesgo. Duró ocho meses con amenaza de aborto debido al estrés y a la situación que estábamos viviendo. Eh, lo, lo sobrellevé sin EPS, sin nada. Eh, pues yo sentí mucha tristeza porque a pesar de que mi papi lo despidieron, se nos, nos, se nos estaba yendo la tristeza, pero gracias a Dios a mi hermanito Martín, llegó la felicidad de esta casa. <risa> Son 10 meses que para nosotros han sido 10 meses de lucha y y queremos que mucha gente siga este ejemplo para que algún día se nos respete nuestros derechos humanos se nos respete nuestros derechos como seres humanos
yo de todas maneras yo continúo aquí en la lucha a pesar de que la situación en mi hogar es muy dura cuando seamos grandes yo quiero que esta historia nunca se olvide y lo más complicado y lo más horrible es que el gobierno colombiano sabe de esta situación incluso el gobierno norteamericano por eso es que nosotros les pedimos la ayuda a ustedes de corazón de que si nos ayudan a denunciar esta noticia en Estados Unidos para que la gente se concientice para nosotros va a ser la ayuda más grande que hemos esperado durante todo el tiempo que llevamos acá So that video and the others, if people want to see them again or tell someone else about them, they're on YouTube. There's a channel, Asotrecol, A-S-O-T-R-E-C-O-L. You can find them there. Right. I'm hoping we have the graphics for that, but it's A-S-O-T-R-E-C-O-L.com. I'm finally right, starting to remember page, that. And also on YouTube, that channel. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. Uh, but that burn that young lady had on her Tengo leg. Por mi vida oh, there we go. We're getting the audio now that it's over. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, apparently we had audio troubles on that, but uh, couldn't happen at a better time because uh, uh, very few people speak Spanish. I think to watch the show and with the, the subtitles worked great. And uh, that was a f uh, it was one family, I think. Wasn't right. It? That's the family of one of the workers, and that's representative of what many of them are going through. Mm hmm. And like we were talking about during that, uh, I brought up the point that um, up here there's a lot of labor unions that they can help out the folks that are on strike or the folks that are having troubles and other labor unions can can join in but there's not as much ability down there to do that so these people are living off a bowl of rice they're living off of their neighbors there has been support from some of the labor federations the CUT is the most militant federation CUT in Colombia and they've come by and supported uh, Sinat Trinal which is the same union that was victimized by Coca-Cola uh, they've also come by and supported very strongly mm -hmm. so they have gotten solidarity within Colombia from the labor movement but there's not a union in the plant, in the GM operation, that can stand up for them the way they need. Right. That's all the more reason for folks in this country to, to get on there and, and lend a hand as best they can. Well, with 16 minutes left, uh, you, there was one more little uh, video that you, you selected. Uh, you might mention that one. There's one more where a guy describes what it's like losing the job, how that process works, and what happens when they try and do something about it to claim their rights. All right. If we can get that one up there, then maybe we can open the phones. Por mi vida porque nosotros nos dimos cuenta que nos estaban persiguiendo no sabemos con qué intenciones. Por el hecho de estar enfermos eh, nos despidieron. Yo no he tenido problemas con nadie sino solamente con la empresa General Motors. Que ellos mismos tenían nuestras historias médicas. Salgo de acá, salgo el fin de semana en mi casa, me quedo los dos días, sábado y domingo encerrado en la casa con mi familia. Ellos tienen su departamento médico dentro de la empresa para detectar dichas dolencias. Y así la empresa podía determinar qué personas estábamos enfermas para podernos despedir con cualquier argumento, sea porque nos terminaban el contrato. Yo tuve que escolarizar un tiempo a mi familia, a mis hijas del colegio porque no sé, por amenazas, por temor a que nos fueran a asesinar o a hacer algo o porque ellos mismos buscaban testigos diciendo que nosotros dañamos vehículos. Que las directivas de la empresa tomen la, la decisión de sacar a la gente supuestamente por justas causas, cuando la verdadera justa causa es que, que estamos enfermos. Eh, empiezo yo a ser eh, como amenazado por mis superiores. Y, y todo está comprobado, los exámenes de todos muestran las patologías, enfermedades. Cuando vieron la oportunidad de de sacarme pues vieron que se ha bajado la producción y me sacaron pero realmente me sacaron fue porque yo estaba pidiendo reubicación por la mano empezaron a mandarnos dirigentes del pacto colectivo me despidieron por el hecho de contar con una enfermedad de tipo profesional declarada por la EPS y la ARP diciéndonos que, que, que nos acercáramos a la oficina de relaciones laborales y que arregláramos porque si no nos iban a sacar de la empresa sin nada y lo que se ha estado ante los jueces, ellos me dan la razón de que por estar enfermo profesionalmente debió haberme despedido por medio del Ministerio de Trabajo, pero ellos violaron la norma y me sacaron así sin, sin cumplir los requisitos. Eh, nosotros pues lógicamente asustados, eh, vulnerables, porque no sabíamos qué hacer, no, no conocíamos muy bien nuestros derechos. Y me hicieron firmar un papel, un documento que pues yo no conocía porque no conozco de leyes. Al cual pues... Nunca lo dejaron revisar. Eh, al año de cumplir la incapacidad, la empresa me llamó a arreglar, supuestamente. 
y el arreglo era pagarme el año de contrato que tenía ganado y si no arreglaba pues me sacaban lo que temen es que nosotros denunciemos esto y se haga público pasado año y medio con otros dos compañeros que les pasó la misma situación iniciamos proceso sobre esas actas en el ministerio para que hicieran una investigación. La realidad que se vive sobre el acoso laboral, sobre los desvíos injustificados, sobre los engaños por parte de la empresa hacia los trabajadores. Después de un año de investigación, las actas resultaron falsas. Eh, el inspector Alvarado se prestó junto con el apoderado, el apoderado de la empresa, el doctor Ricardo Pérez Gaviria, para hacer dichas actas. De tal investigación, el señor Alvarado fue sancionado por 12 meses de suspensión de su cargo. En este momento se encuentra en la cárcel modelo porque también se inició un proceso ante la fiscalía. Sobre la corrupción que existe entre el gobierno y las empresas multinacionales de aquí de Colombia, por ejemplo, el amanguale que existe entre General Motors con Motores y el Ministerio de Trabajo de Protección Social. Aunque la empresa es muy poderosa. Creo que el gobierno de Colombia está todo a favor, está muy comprado por la empresa. Que la gente se entere completamente, esto es, un, esto es un escándalo para ellos, esto es un desprestigio para ellos, ellos temen de eso. Aquí dentro del país ellos manipulan ARPs, juntas, el propio ministerio se demostró ya que el, que el inspector se prestó junto con la empresa a espaldas del ministerio. Pero sé que esto va a tener una solución y una solución a favor de nosotros porque tenemos toda la razón, tenemos muchas pruebas que pueden demostrar que nosotros tenemos y estamos hablando con la verdad. Oh, before we move on, uh, there's a petition, change.org. I change forgot about org. that. Yes. Yeah. Right. That is one way people can weigh in. Right, you can uh, put in the search terms of disabled Colombian GM workers, you can put aso tre col, and find a petition and sign it. It's been growing rapidly recently and that really helps. Right, and that's, that's one of the main things we need to do is get people involved in that. And they know people are watching at that point with those, with those petitions. So where does the petition go, to GM or to the Colombian government or? Both of the above, plus the U.S. government. So it goes to GM corporate, goes to GM Columbia, goes to the U.S. Department of Labor, goes to the Colombian Ministry of Labor. All right. Well, so we might, if we can, uh, I don't know if we put the phone number, if we got a graphic for the phone number, we didn't, it didn't work out last week, but it's 288-4448, 503-288-4448. I'll mention that a couple times over there. Oh, we do have a graphic. Oh, they're on the ball tonight. Great crew. Anyway, well, if the phones are going to light up, possibly, but we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit. You have a, do a labor show on, at KBU, and you've covered this issue, and... Right, on KBU Labor Radio, Monday nights at 6 p.m. Every Monday? Every Monday. It's different people. It's a collective that does the show. So Jamie Partridge and I do the fourth Monday of each month. But Jorge Pada, we have had his audio on the show a couple times. So if people go to www.kboo.fm slash labor radio, you can hear him speak in his own words, translated. You hear the Spanish and the English both. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to take my word for it. You can hear what he says himself. Similar right. to these videos here. Similar, but probably longer, too. They get go into more depth. About 15 yeah. minutes or so, right. Yeah. But a couple different settings. So we, we had one from Columbia and also one from Detroit talking to the Auto Workers Union. Uh -huh. well, that's great. People need to hear these words of these folks. And uh, 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 bringing the video in from YouTube, like I mentioned, uh, it was Aso Trey Cole, A S O T R E C O L dot com. There's numerous other videos, and all are all short like this, some quite a few even shorter. And then folks can find out uh, firsthand what these people down there are going through. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's the same situation in this country, it's just not as drastic. And there's the number 288 4448. Folks want to call. I think we got a couple, three lines, but you can access all the lines with that one, uh, with that one phone number. Uh, we'll just continue on. We got like nine minutes left. Let me also point out something I really should mention. The people in Colombia, these workers and their families, are very appreciative of what people do here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So when Jorge came up to the U.S., he brought with him a thousand handmade. They call them mani. It's like a bracelet. So he brought a thousand of these with him as gifts to people here, just as a way of saying thank you, as a way of sharing their struggle. 
And also as a way of when people ask you what it is, it's an organizing tool. You can explain what's going on and what the fight is. Mm -hmm. They send another thousand back up with Paige in June. So, I mean, these people make these by hand as a way to, to be in contact, physical contact, in fact, with us. So the, the, the appreciation that's expressed repeatedly for whatever efforts people can make is just fantastic. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't always know whether someone knows that you're trying to help them or if they really appreciate that. In this case, it's very clear. They, they demonstrate it with a ver very handy thing. I think we've got a call. Uh, this will be the first caller on our new system. We'll see how it goes. First caller, you're on the air. Hey, what's up, you guys? Hey, I can hear your voice. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. All right. You have a comment or a question? Hey. Yeah, uh, yeah. What I just I just stumbled upon you guys. What are you chatting about? Are you guys talking about uh, any any green initiatives or eco friendly sustainable actions here? Oh, uh, we're talking about some situations, uh, labor situations in uh, Colombia, having to do with with uh, uh, workers that are being uh, displaced and denied uh, being taken care of after they've been they've been hurt. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you, you know, you might. Uh, if you're interested in any of these issues, you could go, you know, continue watching the program, but you could go to ASOTRECOL is a website dot com, but you can find out more about it. I would love to check that out. Yeah, thank you for leading me in that great direction. All uh, right, maybe well, you can check out, you can check us out at phiplanet.com, dot com, p h i planet dot com, and uh, see what we're all about. P h i planet. You got it. All right. Hey, thanks. I'll write that down. And thanks I think for the show, guys. All right. Thank you. Well, I sell a little self promotion, but you know, we might learn something. Five Planet, huh? All right, is there another call? We'll get the next caller up. That was effortless. Next caller, you're on the air. Jim, I'm so glad you're back live. All right, thank you. It's good to be here. <laughs> a little bumpy, but it's, here we are. I've had a soft spot forever for uh, Central America, El Salvador, Nicaragua, so this is right up my heart uh -huh. string. Um, Had you heard about this yet? Uh, uh, no, I hadn't, but it seems to me there's so many simple ways this could be fixed. How much better public relations would it be for GM to take care of these people than run a damn Super Bowl ad? I mean, yeah, there you go. this is a no-brainer. Uh -huh. Why doesn't our embassy buy a whole need new in, in Colombia, buy a whole fleet of those GM cars with the provision that the entire proceeds go to taking care of these families? I mean, there's a ton of ways that this could be massaged that wouldn't cost the company or us much, would be great PR for GM. I just don't understand why they dig in their heels and let people sit there with their lips stitched up. It's appalling. It's authoritarian. <laughs> there's a lot it's of what? pride and arrogance involved here. You're right. It wouldn't cost the corporation the size of GM very much money at all to fix this problem if they, if they cared to. And with all the tax dollars we gave them, why don't we just lean on them? You know, I think this presidential election coming up is going to be a really good opportunity to get more out front with a lot of these issues. Uh, I, I don't know if you heard the story, Jim, that Amy Goodman did on the Huffington Post is doing, but uh, Romney's big initial investors in Bain Capital, approximately 40% of his initial money, came from El Salvadoran oligarchs who were funding the death squads and Roberto Dobison in El Salvador. Well, we're back to the 70s. And they are still partners in Bain Capital. Uh, it, it, this should be out there. Everybody should be talking about it. It is time to start treating the indigenous people of this continent with respect. Amen. And it takes thinking outside the box to solve these problems. Look, you know, you've brought a couple of good, really good uh, solutions, maybe not total solutions, but moving in that direction that, that uh, we're not hearing about from either you know the American government or the Colombian government or, or, the, or the, the corporate corporate world, and uh, they would it would be nothing but a win-win for them. They could, it's they lunch could, money for GM. It's lunch money. Yeah, that's for true. And that's also why GM needs to have their feet yeah. held to the fire. They have to feel yeah. the public pressure and realize they have a public relations issue here that's going to cost them more money than it would take them to solve the problem. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Well, I'm I should appreciate the call. <laughs> Bye. All right. Uh, that's a, that's a great point. You know that uh, uh, they could come out. They could come out heroes rather than assholes. Right. They. I mean, GM <laughs> corporate is distanced to some extent from this situation, so they could be the white knight here. They could come in and say, "Okay, we're going to make this right and go forward in a better way." There, there are ways they can present this that protect their prestige if that's a primary consideration. Our primary consideration, of course, is justice for these workers. 
but if it's necessary to present it in a way that helps people you know, feel okay about the image, there are formulas that could be found. Mm -hmm. The thing is it has to be found fast. These guys are starving. Right, and you know the same thing has happened with Coca-Cola with the, uh, what is it, uh, I don't know if, if uh, Coke Kills is still out there. Oh, yeah. But uh, was it CokeKills.org? Well, it was Killer Coke. Killer yeah. Coke, that was it. Yeah. And uh, the same situation, that you mentioned Sinatral, which was their the labor union down there. And, uh, well, maybe they're not getting a black eye because it's, it's really difficult to get the word out. Well, actually, that union just had their 30th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And they're very conscious of the people who've given their lives to build their movement. So it's certainly something that's in the forefront of people's minds in Colombia. I think, in fact, it was Bolivia just said they're not going to have Coca-Cola anymore in a country. Mm -hmm. You want to have like two countries in the world not have it. So part of it's up to the people taking sovereignty themselves in their own nations. But that includes us holding corporations responsible that are based in our nation that we own. Right. And how many billions of dollars are they making? It, uh, it wouldn't hurt them to, to uh, pay a little bit more. Like I was reading, we don't have much time left, I was reading... Uh, a little, a little paper put out by uh, Jim Hightower today on uh, making a case for the, for the uh, ten dollar minimum wage, mm -hmm. and they say, well, that's gonna, it'll shut down production, and you know, they, they, it won't work. But God, it's not the case at all. If you give people more money, you treat them right, it makes things work better. It greases the wheels. It doesn't shut things down. We could do with a few less CEOs, and we'd pay a whole <laughs> lot more workers. That's true. That's true. That's another way of looking at it. And, uh, you know, if, if people had more money, they'll spend that money. And, and uh, these folks in Colombia, you know, they were getting taken care of. People would feel better about the government. They'd feel better about everything around them. You know, it, it puts people, if they got a smile on their face, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's electric. It, it goes out. But, you know, if, if people are forced to starve and, and uh, make a spectacle of themselves, sewing their mouth shut in order to, to try to get what, what's due them, then that just makes everything so intense. It's a very desperate situation. They would not have done this otherwise. It wasn't a rash decision. There had been talk about this previously. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that somebody did in some fit of emotion. It was a conscious choice based on how urgent the situation is. And it's getting more urgent. I mean, they've been fasting for three weeks. I mean, I know, when, I know that uh, the locally Cameron Witten got to like 55 and he had to quit. That's about the extreme, and Cameron's younger than these guys are. He right. was also, right now, our climate is milder, so they're out there in the rain. It gets real cold and damp at night in Bogota, it warms up in the daytime, but it's because they're close to the equator, the seasons aren't like they are here. It's right. more elevation that matters. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're going to be suffering exposure in a way that's going to make this worse. And uh, it, uh, it could work against them. It could work for them, hopefully. And we've only got a minute left. You, you want to kind of finish off? You have a couple of decent sound bites? I mean, this is, you've, we've covered this very well, but you may want to emphasize something. I think the key thing to me, what Jorge Pato, the president of this association, said to me a couple of days ago, was that they're pinning their hopes on what we here in North America can do. They know they can't win this fight by themselves. They know it depends upon us to stand up for them to fight for their rights. So anything you can do, if you can make a phone call, sign a petition online, get on Facebook, whatever you can do to help, that's needed, and it's needed now. Change.org. And remember, you know, these, these monstrous corporations were spawned in the pit of America, Coca-Cola, General Motors, and uh, they, they're, they're going out and doing this, these, uh, these act activities, apparently with the, uh, with the, at the be, not the behest, but the American government letting them do it. So well, we're out of time. We'll be back next week. I want to thank the crew, thank the callers, and especially the guests. John, thank you. Thank you all. All right. Good night.